This is a show about jewelry, why we wear it, why it matters, how it's made, and what it means. I'm Alex D, and I turn cannabis into gold. I make mind-blowing jewelry in gold, silver, and platinum from cannabis plants here in Canada for stage, screen, for people who want to rock crazy jewelry. I'm the Cannabis Goldsmith. It's the depth of winter here in Upper Canada, but you know, it hasn't been that bad. It's been sunny. There hasn't been snow all that much. It's been warm. It's strange. But I'll take it. You know what? I need the warmth. I need the sun. I want to be sitting out in the backyard with my sketchbook drawing designs, sitting under the big trees, watching the weed grow. That is what I want to be doing. Not, I don't want to be inside locked away until spring. But I am. So what am I doing? I'm reading books. I Today in this episode, I'm going to talk about three books that I got that I'm reading right now and why you should get them. And also, I'm going to talk about findings. Findings for jewelry making. I know it's all YouTube videos now, But I like books. I like having books on a bookshelf in my studio or in my home where I can kind of, you know, if I need to know something, I can consult and I dig into the book and I read. Now, granted, these days people do that online. But it's getting harder and harder to find the information you need online. It's taking longer and longer because there's so much crap online. And most of it is designed to sell you things. So you're not really getting the information you need. It's really, really hard to find the information you need, technical information. It's all, all the edges have been sanded off by the search algorithms or by the AIs generating all this content and putting it online. It's just like, oh God, man. That's why I like having books. So... If I can't find something online, I'm going to I'm going to look into my trusty books. And I've got a few trusty books I've mentioned previously on this podcast that I go to if I want to find out something about the way why a piece is designed a certain way or how to make tubes out of gold or like just just these technical questions that I mean you could look on YouTube to 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 see how it is done. But more more chances than not, you're not even going to find the information you need and you'll end up watching all this other shit that doesn't doesn't help you at all. So that's what the internet is becoming. So it's nice to have books. It's nice to have books on the bookshelf. So this episode, I'm going to talk about three books that I bought recently. Um, these are not being sent to me by publicists. So, oh, and and I'm not you know, interviewing people here that a publicist has sent over to promote their books. No, no, no. These are books that I've spent my own money on. And uh, and I, I bought them because I wanted to know stuff. I think one of the most important things as an artist or as a, as a jeweler, as a designer, is curiosity. You know, how to, how, how to make your vision real. You know, that's how it starts. You're like, okay, I want to make this painting or I want to make this ring or I want to make this pendant. Like, how do I do it? And and you know what it should look like in your brain. You're not getting that from the books, but what you're doing getting from the books or the YouTube videos is the is the techniques that you have to learn in order to make your vision real, right? So, may, so maybe you're a jeweler and you know how to do everything except set set gems so you have to you have to know a bit about that even though you don't set gems you have to know how gems are set in order to design your piece so that when your piece is ready for gem setting uh it it, they can do it it's it's doable right it might not be doable you've spent all this time designing the piece and then you find out that gems can't be set in it for one reason or another and you're fucked. 
So it's wise to learn about gem setting, how gems are set, so you can keep this, this data in your brain as you're designing the piece in your mind. So you're sitting there in the backyard with your sketchbook and you're drawing out, you're drawing out your design and you're thinking what it should look like and, and stuff. And if you have a basic knowledge or a better than basic knowledge, that's even better, um, about gem setting and how gems are set in different ways, in different geometries of metal and stuff, then your design is going to be better. It's not going to be influenced, I don't think. Maybe, you know. But your design will be better. You, you won't have to change it after to suit, to accommodate defects in the design that, were, that came in in the beginning. I'm always looking for books to learn stuff. Like if, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely, uh, absolutely curious. The best feature you can have as an artist is curiosity. Because you're always, you'll always be reaching out to find information on how to make your, your art better. And I, I think that's absolutely key. So anyway, I, the three books I got is like, I'll tell you, I have an issue with drawing. I mean, people can understand my drawings, I think, you know. I mean, I'm not stick figure bad where, you know, you draw a little stick figure. No, I'm not that bad. I can do a little better than that, but I have problems drawing perspective. I know these days people say, oh, use a computer or whatever. No, no, no. I, I, I like drawing. I like doing this, this manually, right? That's how, I, that's how I realize these pieces as I first draw them out on paper. You know, I'm always looking to improve how how the products my products are made so if, if i can learn anything about anything about the way i can make them better that's where where i go and that's what these three books are about that i'm going to talk about today like i have a problem drawing like drawing drawing fuck my whole life i've I, I've not been able to draw perspective like you know a three-dimensional object on paper and a lot of people can't do it i mean um I remember, I remember, um, well, Grayson Perry says, photograph your shit, right? Photograph your art to see what it looks like. Like, I would love to be able to draw my art. Like, if I made a, a jewelry piece, I'd like to be able to draw it, to, you know, on pen and, in pen and ink. Or to draw it in pen and ink and then make it real afterwards. I like to be able to go both directions with the drawing, you know, like before and after kind of thing. I like to take a model, a life model, and then draw it on a pad or or, there, or draw an idea from my brain on a pad and then show it to somebody and say, okay, can we, can we put the settings, the stone setting, you know, the diamonds in this side of it here like that? And I want them to be able to understand what I'm talking about when they're looking at my drawings. Now, my drawings are, are okay. I mean, they're not fabulous, but the key defect in my drawings is perspective. I, somehow I'm not seeing perspective when I'm drawing in pen and ink. So there's a book for that. <laughs> and it's a classic. It's an old classic from 1939. It's by a guy named Ernest R. Norling, and it's called Perspective Made Easy. And it's a tiny little thin book, and it goes step by step on how to draw perspective. It's like, it's a classic. I, I don't know, if I, I didn't go to art school, but I'm sure they would give you this in art school or tell you to buy it or something in, in Drawing 101 or whatever. So I'm, I'm going back to the drawing board basically here to learn how to draw perspective. So I'm in the middle of Ernest R. Norling's book, Perspective Made Easy. It's an excellent book. It's inexpensive. Get it if you if you have a hard time drawing three dimensional things on paper with pen and ink. So hopefully my perspective drawings will be better after I'm reading this book, so I can I can you know communicate better either with myself or with other people when I'm showing other people, especially clients. Like often I'm interacting with clients, I'm drawing shit uh, with pen and ink and then sending them drawings, right? Because this stuff is all custom that we do. It's all custom work. So someone would 
contact us and and you know they want to get something made and then we we start sending drawings to them or or photos of products we've made already and we engage with them like that and and in the process of creating this this amazing piece for them right that's how it works so anyway i can improve my drawings uh here um to communicate the ideas better is the goal and thus ernest r norling norling what a great name all right perspective made easy by ernest r norling the the next book i want to talk about is a book, you know, book publishing these days, you can publish your own books, basically. I think you can do it on Amazon or whatever. There's different, like, digital book publishers where you, you write out your book and you send it to the book publisher and they'll publish the book and you can sell it on Amazon. And a lot of, a lot of books out there now are self-published, basically. Um, they're, they're works of love or, or experience or personal experience that... People just feel they have to put out there, you know. I guess they're not looking for bestsellers, or maybe they are, I don't know. Uh, they're hoping they can sell some copies, I guess, and hoping some people might find their books interesting. I guess why else would they do it, really? Or maybe just because they have to. The self-publishing phenomenon is allowing us to get books from a variety of sources. Now, the quality of the books can vary. I mean, the, the quality of the writing can vary. It can be kind of old school, you know, structured. It can be, uh, it can be casual. It can be, it can be uh, read like somebody sitting across from you at coffee talking to you kind of thing. Whatever. If, if the, the information is there, if the content, if the data is there that that you need to get out of the book as long as you can understand it and as long as you can uh, as long as it's the ideas communicate through the paper to your brain then you're you're laughing right then this is the goal this is this is what it is right this is what you want so the self publishing thing is sometimes there's a variable quality in in that the tone of writing between these books and the different writers it's it's not as homogenized as it used to be. Like, if you have a publisher, like Penguin Books or whatever, what they do is they they apply standards to all their the books that they publish, and so there's a kind of there's a kind of homogeneity to the to their output. But with the self-published books, you can these self-publishers can do whatever the fuck they want. Anyway, I got one of those books, and it's. Um, it's by Ken Paulson. It's the Goldsmith book by Ken Paulson. It's obviously a labor of love by a goldsmith, by a jeweler who knows what the hell he's doing, is really experienced. And uh, the, the book's written in a very casual way. Like, um, But there's a lot of data in here. There's, it's a really good book on setting on gem setting like half the book is on gem setting and it has his drawings his own drawings and how he does it and there's like all kinds of tips in in this to gem setting that you would it would take you years to learn uh through trial and error and mistakes and expensive mistakes so that's why i bought this book i i i'd heard that the back end of it was was really good on setting and i always want to to know more about that and anything i can anything i can inhale about gem setting or about anything related to jewelry design or or art as it relates to jewelry design or the technical aspects of jewelry manufacturing anything like this i'm all over it so the goldsmith book by ken paulson and there's a sub title an old guy guide to how and why we do this all right i'm an old guy so maybe that that was it but no 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 i i bought this for the um the setting the setting data the the, the information on setting gems is really good okay the last book i want to talk about today is about findings it's a book on findings i'm like when you make custom a jewelry you need when you make any kind of jewelry you need findings now what are findings findings are the little bits and bobs and and little tiny pieces that connect your jewelry 
to other pieces of jewelry, to chains. There's the little the little bits, right, that that you're going to need either need to make or buy in order to get your pieces functional in humanity. Well, they, it can be anything. It can be like it can be a jump ring. A small ring of metal that holds a, a little locket on a chain. Okay, a jump ring is a finding. On the end of the chain, there's a little like a lobster clasp thing that connects to a ring on the other end of the chain. Those are findings too, right? On the pendant, say the pendant's a, a gemstone, but there's there's a kind of like a, um, a cap on it with a, a little gold cap that, that the jump ring goes through, that's a finding as well, right? On a, on, a, on a brooch, the pin that holds the brooch on the lapel or on a dress is a finding. So findings are everywhere. They're all over the place. And as a result, there are, there are companies that make findings. They make, they mass produce common findings. You can buy jump rings by the hundred. You can buy uh, lobster clasps. You can buy all these like these little bits that connect jewelry pieces to other jewelry pieces. Now, for for stuff like beading and for for jewelers who who just assemble jewelry, they don't make it from scratch. They just assemble jewelry from pre-existing pieces. Findings are, are critical, right? Findings are what it's all about. So you have a little box basically with like a bunch of cubes in it, like all divided up with different findings. And you can, you can assemble jewelry pieces from all these findings with, with the other components, right? But I'm always interested in, in learning about findings. And uh, I have been especially interested of late because I'm working on brooches, right? And, and the way they are attached to lapels or dresses, I, I've been studying this now for like a month. I've been trying to get all the information I can about how to make these brooch uh, backs and these pin backs. The small ones are are easy to understand. I mean, you can you can go into a secondhand store um, and look at some some costume brooches and turn them around and look at the back, and you can see how a pin back. They're all they all look the same, right? You can buy findings like that in gold or silver or whatever, um, but that's not what we need here. I need I need something that can hold enormous pieces on lapels or big heavy pieces. I need, I need findings that can deal with really weird shaped pieces that are not uniform or standard, right? I don't want to design my pieces to fit the findings that I, that that are, that are commercially sold. I want to make findings for my pieces, custom findings. So that's why. I was looking for a findings book, a book on findings, and and I found one. Holy fuck! Can you believe it? It's by Sarah McRae. It's called Fastenings and Findings for Jewelers, and it's just that. It's a book about different different components, the jewelry components, and how they're made. It's it's got some really good detail on brooches and pin backs which is which made this whole thing this whole book worth it for me it's it's fantastic it's got like great detail it's got excellent drawings it explains the reasoning behind the findings uh it's going to save me a lot of time when i'm designing findings for our products like the brooch backs and the uh, the belt buckle Hardware, that's a finding too. The stuff on the back of the belt buckle and that's big, heavy kind of findings that I'm working on now for this cannabis leaf belt buckle. I'm hoping to make a trip to Europe this uh, this summer if I can, and I'm going going to be I'm going to be looking at the backs, and I'd be going into antique shops all over looking at the backs of jewelry pieces. 
and taking photos of them to to put in my in my brain for designs that I make for huge pieces. That's the mission. Findings. So anyway, those three books I recommend um, you get. If you have issues with with drawing stuff on with pen and ink, um, Perspective Made Easy by Norling might help. I hope it's going to help me. That's what I'm I'm in the thick of right now, and it is. It's written well, I, and it's a classic. I like it already. Hopefully, it'll help my drawings. Uh, the Goldsmith Book by Ken Paulson, an old guy's guide to how and why we do this. It's self-published, but it has a lot of great tips on gem setting. And then the Findings Book. I wish it was thicker, but it's still great. Fastenings and Findings for Jewelers by Sarah McRae. Okay, what am I doing today in the studio? I'm still working on the damn belt buckle. Um, I've got the front done. I'm working on the back um, the back hardware. This is going to be a sterling silver belt buckle. It's going to be a, it's a, cu- it's a custom-made belt buckle. I'm making it for myself, actually. I think it, it's just going to be an amazing piece. But as the one side has got a live cast cannabis leaf in the face, and then the back of it, I was just going to put hardware. But I think I'm going to put some some detail into the back of this too. I want a two-sided belt buckle. I don't want like a one-sided belt buckle, like you get these mass-produced belt buckles. I want detail or design, or I want some shit on the back here to make it like wicked or better even better. So I'm going, I thought I would be sending it off for casting to Ud, but I'm not. I'm going to, I'm going to make it even better. I've been recording myself on video and looking at the results because eventually this pod is going to be going on YouTube and we'll probably be recording video, um, recording it to video. So I'm, I'm, I'm practicing with that. I mean, I'm not one of these persons who can just put a phone, sit in front of a phone with a phone pointed at them. And uh, it has to be better. (laughs) I'm a perfectionist a bit. So the video will be a little bit better quality if I can make it that. And um, uh, for if we ever go with a full full video thing on YouTube, I'm still digitizing or, or videoizing or whatever it is, turning these audio podcasts into video to put onto YouTube with uh, different backgrounds and stuff. I'm still doing that. It's an onerous task. Uh, again, recommendation. If you're going to start a podcast, you know, format it for all the platforms while you're doing it, not a year later, because you'll have a lot of work to catch up on. Anyway, so that's what I'm doing there with that. Uh, working on the belt buckle findings, working on the belt buckle detail on the back, uh, working on on practice, practice of myself in front of a camera, a video camera. When you hate yourself being photographed, and it, it, oh God, it's like, uh, uh, I'll get over it. I'll get there. Anyway, so that's the mission today. I'm going to go in there, throw... Throw another log on the fire first and then go into the studio, record more video, look at it, see see if there's any way I can can improve. Again, I'm not a, a fashion model, but um, I just want to make sure the the content is communicated, like what I want to say comes across. That's the most important thing. And also visually, I want it to look okay, like photographically like not pixelated or whatever. I want it to be clean, good, clean quality video to upload to YouTube. And then eventually I'll be able to interview people um, on video. I know it'll come to that. I don't want it to, but that's where it's going. Yeah. The sun is coming up over the U.S. right now. It looks absolutely beautiful. You have a beautiful country, you Americans. I see you over there. You're, you're, you're just beautiful. I've got books in the studio here or in my home from other jewelry designers too. I, I, I like looking at their, their work to see how they 
they thought of stuff. And not only famous designers, but some not so famous, you know. I, I buy books on sculpture just just to see three-dimensional objects and how they look. It helps me understand like how to photograph objects better too because if I see good photography of sculpture I can apply the same techniques to my to my jewelry photography or videography you know when I'm shooting videos of it but I'm really looking for a book on Suzanne Bell Perron now I've she's a jeweler um, R.I.P. She's a, a an amazing jewelry designer, and her piece says every piece I've seen by her, I I like. I mean, and I like them because they're different. I I you know, I, they're not pieces that I would wear or recommend somebody would wear, but just the way they look, it's like something from outer space. A lot of her stuff. So, I'm trying to find a book on her on her either her or her designs and I'm having such a hard time I'd love to get a book like that so I can just kind of leaf through it and see or just maybe if I can find a documentary on her I'd love to watch a documentary on her I don't even know if such a thing exists I'm gonna go look for it but I think as a designer she brings this she brings this uh, she brought this energy to to jewelry that and we need more of, I think, that energy. We need something to differentiate, um, to differentiate commercial jewelry. We need to bring it up, and and we need more of what she had, I think, in the jewelry sector. Suzanne Bell Perron. Look at her. Look for her stuff. Google her, and you'll you'll see some of her stuff. It's just fucking incredible. Um, there's another jeweler out there like her, who, who I'm hoping to talk to. This year, if we get around to interviewing other jewelers or just just having conversations with with other designers or artists about their work or their their process and how they make stuff, because that's what I'm interested in. Uh, you know, like part of my process here is the books I read, and and I've told you three today, but um, but I want to find out. Like if I had Suzanne Bell Perron sitting in front of me right now, I'd be asking her what books she read and and like you know where. Where are you drawing your ideas from? Where is it coming from? What do you What do you do? Are you in the shower when you get your ideas, or are you like walking on a beach somewhere, or are you having a coffee and a baguette at the cafe? Like, what, I want to know where the designs are are coming from. You know, not necessarily where she gets her. I I just want to know how they strike because design um often strikes. It strikes like it's like lightning, right? And you, it's like set the set and setting that people talk about when they do psychedelics. You know, you get a really a better you're you're, you're going to have a better experience if the set and setting are are um, cooked up to to influence the outcome of the psychedelic. The same thing is uh, design inspiration is the same thing. I think if if you can get the set and setting right, if I'm sitting at a at a sidewalk cafe in Paris eating a baguette. And um, and I'll I'll come up with an amazing design like inspired by that, and uh, I'll get an incredible design out of it. Or if I'm like in the backyard sitting uh, there with my sketchbook under the trees, just just drawing, smoking a joint and drawing designs, right? Now I'll get other kind of designs. It's the set and setting that that allows the the design inspiration to strike. And also what you've crammed your brain full of too, I think. Like the more you can cram your brain full of full of um, full of ideas and vis- visual ideas, whether it's from nature, from other artists, or from museums or whatever. Just cram your brain with shut and and your brain will you'll your brain will sort it out stuff. Um from the set and setting you find yourself in. Anyway, that's what I think. But Suzanne Belperon, if there's a documentary about her or a book about her, send me an email, alexd at cannabisgoldsmith.com because I'd really like to read them. That's it for me this week. I'm going to go into the into the shop and do work today. 
the the Americans, you're looking good. The sun's coming up over over you today. Um, you're not too late for Valentine's Day, people. You can, as I said in the podcast a couple of podcasts ago, um, leave it up to us. Just if you've forgotten about Valentine's Day, send me an email and we can engage with your special someone, engage them in the process of making the peace for them on Valentine's Day. We'll start the process on Valentine's Day and they will love you. We'll make them an amazing piece. We'll engage them in the process of making it. And they'll remember you forever. The Cannabis Goldsmith is produced by Tribe Communications, Inc. in the Thousand Islands area of Ontario, Canada. You can see what we do at tribe.ca. Send us an email, alexd at cannabisgoldsmith.com. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you next week on The Cannabis Goldsmith.